On this Friday night, it's the eve of the great event, and the final details are coming into view. Megan's dress remains top secret, but look who's going to walk her down the aisle. And Prince Harry offered his own sneak peek, a public walkabout with his brother and best man, Prince William. Plus, our royal watcher is here with the up-to-the-minute inside scoop. Also tonight, a much more difficult story, yet another mass shooting at a U.S. high school. Santa Fe, Texas now joins Parkland, Florida, examples of an American horror story that keeps on repeating. We'll bring you the details and the reaction. This is The National. We're here in historic Windsor, where tomorrow, in just a few hours, actually, Prince Harry and Meghan Markle will become husband and wife. The excitement, obviously, growing all day. I suspect a lot of people may even pull an all-nighter. Not surprisingly, given the energy we experience today. Welcome to Windsor! Windsor was pretty much humming today, those ancient streets packed. Union Jacks and royal emblems everywhere, pints and souvenirs for the tourists and from the tourists, some marriage advice. Be there for everyone, irrespective of your background, you know. Just love each other, put everything else aside. To have lots of babies. <laughs> Harry might have also got some marriage tips from his best man and big brother, William, while they were on their Windsor walkabout today. The two princes greeted like royal rock stars. <laughs> Meghan and her mother, meanwhile, arrived at their hotel, and some 11th hour wedding issues appear to have resolved themselves. We understand that Harry's grandfather, Prince Philip, will be well enough to attend tomorrow, and that Prince Charles will step in to replace Meghan's dad, who cannot attend due to health issues. That news is receiving mixed reviews. I think that's just wonderful, because she's going to be a part of the family, and he's, he's stepping up to the, to the plate. I think it's really odd, quite honestly. They obviously haven't known each other for very long, um, and I think it'll be a little bit awkward, probably, for the both of them. Now, Charles won't walk her down the aisle in the traditional sense, because apparently Meghan Markle is planning to make a strong statement tomorrow by technically giving herself away. We'll talk more about that and other wedding highlights with our own royal expert just ahead. But first, let's take a look at the sheer frenzy of all this. Arnala Ayed spent the day among the royal fans and the armies of journalists covering the wedding, especially the American media, all trying to satisfy a basically insatiable appetite for all things Meghan and Harry. Oh, yeah. And so the gathering begins. Oh, yay! Beckoned by the bells are the romantics. Royal wedding banner! The entrepreneurs, the die-hard fans, and three generations of Canadians who snagged the best seats in the house. There's lots of very, very important uh, news going on in the world, uh, but this is just something extra fun to do, and you can find the world's media attention is all here. The world is, in a sense, watching at least through the eyes of 5,000 of us. They're going to St. George's Chapel and they're gonna get married. 79 international broadcasters, according to Kensington Palace, 160 photographers, all here because of apparently intense interest driven by the couple's double dose of star power. Last year, we had five terror attacks here in the UK. It was a very uh, tragic year for everybody. And finally, the main news that is coming out of the UK is about something that it's good. And the other main stories. Dozens are feared dead after a Cuban Airways plane... Plenty of bad news is competing for airtime. The tragic shooting in Texas, the fallout of the violence in Gaza. All awkward leads when this is the British scene of the day. So will other stories be lost in the shadows of the big day? Not so, says the BBC. It's a big story, you know, and I think just because it's a lighter story doesn't mean we shouldn't cover it in, in a really big way. It's a story that people are really engaged with. 
there are questions about just how engaged. Several polls this week suggest 70% of British citizens are not even interested in the wedding. I described you all as fruitcakes. I apologise now. Embodied, perhaps, in the growing cult following of BBC anchor Simon McCoy, whose deadpan disinterest during live coverage has become legendary. Good evening, Ms Markle. How are you feeling tonight? So is the coverage over the top? Critics say absolutely, but media outlets defend it. And because of all the serious news that is happening in the world, sometimes we need a little focus on the positive. There will be plenty of that here and plenty more journalists. So for better or worse, for a few hours anyway tomorrow, this wedding will be a top story. Nala Ayed, CBC News, Windsor, England. And now let's talk about tomorrow's details with someone who can really translate the subtleties and intricacies of the day. Frankly, you know, the best of royal experts, Katie Nichol, then again, I'm a little bit biased, will be on set together tomorrow, well, actually in a few short hours. Yes. Can you give us a sense of what the tone of tomorrow is likely to be? Well. I think the tone will be a perfect balance between all the pomp and pageantry that we will expect of a royal wedding and that intimate family wedding that Harry has always wanted. William couldn't have it, but Harry can. He's not going to be king. Exactly. Is there a moment that you think will end up being the moment? Well, the dress is going to be a moment for sure. But I, but I think for me, the moment is going to be when they come out of the church um, on those west steps as man and wife. You know, that is the moment that Meghan Markle's life will have changed forever. It's a very important moment. My biggest question, is he going to shave his beard? I keep hearing this question <laughs> about the beard and I was with them a couple of hours ago. Uh, William and Harry were carrying out an impromptu walkabout. The beard was still there. Now, I can tell you, Adrian, exclusively, <laughs> that the Queen doesn't much care for this beard. Uh, she has asked Harry quite subtly to shave it off and he hasn't done. Meghan has succeeded a little bit more in getting him to trim it and keep it a little more in check, so he's looking more groomed. I'd be really surprised if tomorrow it's gone. And actually, there's no protocol that suggests he has to. He, As long as he looks well turned out and presentable and those brass buttons are polished, he's good to go. OK, I'm fine with that. I like the beard. Katie, I know you have really only time for, for a power nap, so I really will see you in the yes, dead of night. Yes, not too many, not too many hours to kit. Very much looking forward to doing this, this, tomorrow with all of you. All right, you take care. Thank, Thank you. you. So as many as a few billion people are expected to catch the wedding tomorrow morning, we will be bringing it to you all live. Here's a look at how it's expected to play out. Prince Harry and Meghan Markle will wake up in separate hotels. Harry is staying with his brother William. Meghan is about a half hour away with her mother. They will make their way to St. George's Chapel together but not before the guests arrive. That starts around 4.30 Eastern time. Harry and William should arrive just over two hours later. The Queen will follow shortly after that, and that leaves one last arrival, and the moment everyone will finally get a glimpse of the dress, and somewhere the fortunes of a designer will soar. And then, of course, comes the big moment, the I do's, the rings, the vows, which likely won't include the word obey. All this in one of the most striking churches in England, built almost seven centuries ago. It is as regal as it is historic. Our Thomas Daglick gives us the full tour. Here it is, the site of the most highly anticipated wedding in Britain in years. St. George's Chapel, where Prince Harry and Meghan Markle will tie the knot here on the grounds of Windsor Castle. Let's go in for an up-close look. Here's the famous aisle where Harry and Meghan will walk in and later walk out as newlyweds. It's not as wide and grandiose as Westminster Abbey where William married Kate or St. Paul's Cathedral where Charles married Diana. But many royals have tied the knot right here. In fact, Harry himself was carried in at just three months old to be baptized right here. With the ceremony happening just to my right, those seated here up front will get the best view in this part of the chapel known as the choir. Not only will they be witnessing history, they'll be seated in a little part of history with this intricate oak carving dating back 
to the late 15th century. It's a lot narrower here, I must say, than it looks on television. Harry himself knows that very well. He was seated right in this spot the day his father Charles married Camilla. Six hundred guests have been invited, meaning some will sit back here in this part of the chapel known as the nave in more modern seating, though in the shadow of that phenomenal stained glass dating back 600 years with the coat of arms of Henry VII. The newlyweds can expect to be greeted by crowds as they walk out, but should we expect to see a kiss on these steps? Maybe. That's something history can't tell us for sure. Thomas Dagg, the CBC News, Windsor, England. Now, when and where will the kiss happen? Maybe on the chapel steps. We do know that the royal couple will meet invited members of select charities at a special spot just outside the church. And then it's off to meet their adoring public. Here's a look at what that will look like. This is a map of the procession route. Let's go for a ride. Here is Windsor Castle. Rooms above this pub are rented out for the wedding. Rumor has it they're charging more than $25,000 Canadian per night. And this is Queen Victoria, Harry's great, 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 great grandmother. She spent most of her time at Windsor. This is known as the Crooked House, for an obviously good reason. It is crooked. There used to be a secret passage from here into the castle that's been blocked off. Prince Charles and Camilla were married right here in 2005, and so were these two. About 32,000 people live in Windsor. 100,000 are in town for the wedding. And that is the base for the Coldstream Guards, the oldest British regiment. This pub is hosting the second most exclusive party in town after the royal one. Only locals are invited inside to watch the wedding. Forget it, you're not getting in, it's full already. This statue commemorates two horses that have drawn the Queen's carriages. Their names are Daniel and Storm. And Storm, by the way, will be in Harry and Meghan's procession. The park around Windsor Castle covers 4,800 acres. And just look at who the park ranger is. And this path is called the Long Walk. It is a very long walk. Horse-drawn vehicles are actually prohibited here without special permission and permission granted for Harry and Meghan. The party itself is beyond these gates, so why don't we stop right here? We're expecting huge crowds along that route, straining for a glimpse of the newlyweds, but there will also be more than a 1,000 members of the public inside the castle, all specially invited by the royal couple. In my mind, I felt... Perhaps this isn't real. It could be just a joke. I was just so shocked. I thought it was fake. I was just saying to my mum, this isn't real, this can't be real. I said to my mum, what the is going on here? So you might be wondering why them? Well, the choices were far from random. I caught up with three people who are heading to the wedding. Their stories a little later as our coverage from Windsor continues. And, of course, the big event tomorrow at 4 a.m. Eastern on CBC. We'll be back with more coverage later in the program. But, Ian, you've got the story of another mass shooting in the United States. That's right, Adrian. This one happened in Santa Fe, Texas, just south of Houston. And scenes look tragically familiar. Heavily armed officers, terrified students, distraught parents. When it was all over, 10 people were dead. A 17-year-old suspect, a student at the school in custody, and tonight, Lindsay Duncombe walks us through what happened. 
The mayhem started just after 7.30 this morning. What's well, that fire? More shots fired, additional shots fired. Still have several more shots fired. He's actually shooting, he's in the art room. The images of another school shooting look routine on cable news, but this is fresh horror for those who lived through it. Everybody just started running outside, and next thing you know, everybody looks, and you hear boom, 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 and I just ran as fast as I could. I was scared for my life. Nobody should go through this. Nobody should be able to feel that in school. This is a place where we're supposed to feel safe. For some, though, this wasn't a surprise. It's been happening everywhere. I felt, I've always kind of felt like eventually it was going to happen here, too. You have been charged with capital murder? The 17-year-old suspect made a brief court appearance and was denied bail tonight. Officials say there were few red flags about Dimitrios Pogorchis. He played on the football team and was said to have friends, though there was this ominous social media post. Officials believe he planted explosives in and around the school and used two weapons, a revolver and a shotgun, legally owned by his father. Today's shooting is the deadliest since 17 people were killed at a high school in Parkland, Florida. The young survivors of that shooting challenged America's cynical acceptance of such violence, prompting school walkouts, protests across the country, and some legislative changes. There was a post-Parkland influence in politicians' tone today, even in gun-friendly Texas. So we can work together on putting together laws uh, that will protect Second Amendment rights, but at the same time ensure that our communities and especially our schools are safer places. The president, too, promised action. Everyone must work together at every level of government to keep our children safe. And so, Lindsay, the Texas governor, the president, seemed to be talking about change, though many were quick to suggest change is not very likely. Well, certainly not the kind of change that gun control advocates would like to see. Let's look at the specifics about what the Texas governor talked about today, Ian. He talked about increased care for mental health. He talked about resources for school safety, including something called hardening schools. And that is a phrase that has been used to describe the possibility of having more armed guards or possibly even armed teachers on school campuses in the United States. And those policies, those ideas, are right in line with the kinds of things that the president, Donald Trump, is comfortable with. And also, significantly, it is in line with the kinds of policies that the National Rifle Association would support. All right, Lindsay, thank you. People touched by the shooting in Parkland, Florida, also speaking out today and voicing anger, frustration, and heartbreak. Among them, a father who lost his 14-year-old daughter. This has been a horrible week. I mean, there, this is the reality of, of gun violence. My week started with Mother's Day, the first without my kid, followed by the three-month anniversary of the shooting, and then followed by today. And, and, and you know, I just, I can't get over that this is happening again. And this was the last day of school for grade 12 students at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School, many of them watching the events in Texas unfold, including Emma Gonzalez, who tweeted, you deserve more than thoughts and prayers. And after supporting us by walking out, we'll be there to support you by raising up your voices. And she's referring to this walkout. Less than a month ago, a small group of students from Santa Fe High School staging a protest in solidarity with the students of Parkland. Those never again signs, tragically poignant tonight. Investigators in Cuba searching for the cause of a plane crash that killed more than 100 passengers and crew today. The tragedy raising new questions about the safety record of the national airline Cubana. <laughs> Plumes of smoke rose from the crash site, clearly visible from Havana's airport. The 737 leased to Cubana had just taken off on a domestic flight shortly after midday when it went down in a field about 20 kilometers away. The country's new president, Miguel Diaz-Canal, joined in the rescue effort. Incredibly, among the twisted wreckage, emergency crews found three survivors, all of them in critical condition. 110 people from several countries were on board. No word yet if that includes any Canadians. 
The crew of six was from Mexico, from the same charter company that leased the plane. Cubana is one of the oldest airlines in Latin America. It offers flights to Cuba from Toronto and Montreal. This plane be smoking. The decades-old U.S. trade embargo has made getting parts difficult, and mechanical problems reportedly forced Cubana to take many of its own aging planes out of service recently. There are no early indications of what caused the crash. Up next on The National, we'll bring you back here to Windsor for more special coverage. When Meghan Markle leaves St. George's Chapel tomorrow, a lot will change for her and the people around her. We'll take you through the po protocol and what's really in a title. And it's not just across the pond. Wedding parties are being planned here in Canada, too, including some who have had their own brushes with royalty. But first, 1,200 members of the public have been invited to the wedding, a royal first. So why them? Turns out these so-called ordinary people are anything but. I opened the letter and swore a little, I'm not going to lie, and said to my mum, what the f is going on here? Because it was just so out of the blue and I had no idea what was coming or why or how. I read it ten times and then it sort of sunk in that I was going to the wedding. <laughs>you saw, Canadians are here and showing their colours, snuggling in and taking their spots, hoping for a glimpse of the royal couple tomorrow, but on the outside of the castle walls. That is not the case for some people. Thousands will get closer, and the luckiest ones, very close. It all depends on a ticket. This is the hottest ticket in town. About 3,200 people are on the guest list for the wedding, but not all of those golden tickets are the same. Most got this letter. Kensington Palace says the couple wanted members of the public to share in their joy. The monarchy's representatives in each county in the United Kingdom invited 1,200 people from their communities, including this cattle farmer. She will have a prime view of the arrivals out on the lawn of the castle, along with palace staff, local school children, and 200 people from the couple's favorite charities. They will be closest to the chapel door, and they'll get FaceTime with Harry and best man Will before the wedding and the newlyweds right afterwards. 600 other guests will watch the ceremony inside the chapel. Their printed invites include the lunch reception. A third of them, a very lucky 200, are invited to the A-list party, an evening reception hosted by Prince Charles. It's just down the road at Frogmore House. One of the biggest perks? getting to see both of Meghan's wedding dresses up close. Now about those 1,200 members of the public. Their communities were given clear rules for nominations. Had to be a mix of ages and backgrounds, but each eligible person must show some leadership, some acts of kindness towards those in need. So who got the lucky golden ticket? Have a look. <laughs> Really, there's nothing that connects these three staggeringly busy Brits. Not their ages, not their geography, not their interests. Hello. Nothing, except of course for the thing none of them quite believed. In my mind, I felt, perhaps this isn't real. It could be just a joke. I was just so shocked. I thought it was fake. I was just saying to my mom, this isn't real. This can't be real. In an era of fake news, this is real, although it took Helen Reeve a few hard looks to be sure. And I opened the letter and swore a little, I'm not going to lie, and said to my mum, what the f is going on here? Because it was just so out of the blue, and I had no idea what was coming or why or how. I read it ten times, and then it sort of sunk in that I was going to the wedding. She is going to the wedding. <laughs> All three of them are. Recipients of a royal first, invites from the couple to 1,200 members of the public. Why then? We have arrived. <laughs> <laughs> Helen, at least, seems to have no clue. I just can't quite, can't imagine, quite imagine it, not yet. No. It's just, it just seems not yeah, real, does it? We're just... <laughs> just ordinary people, aren't we? We are, completely ordinary, <laughs> and we're going to be thrust into this world where there's going to be cameras and people, celebrities and royal family and mm. then us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's not quite as random as it sounds. Starting as a teenager with no land, no capital and one heifer 
She built a business, now has 50 Dexter cows. Mini cows, actually. Teaches agriculture and has become a big promoter of women in farming. Clearly, that caught a royal eye. Very good girl on you, huh? It's been a hard slog to get here, but with, you don't get anywhere in life if you don't put hard work in. And my mum and dad have always instilled it in me that if you don't put 150% into everything you do, then you're not going to achieve anything. <laughs> right on cue. Ooh, <laughs> Funny thing about that wedding invitation, by the way, it suggests the guests bring their own lunches and chairs. Yeah, Helen yeah. and her plus one, her mom, taking it in stride. <laughs> We'll have some British snacks. We'll have some crisps and <laughs> Could take cheese some sandwiches. Beef sandwiches. Yeah. <laughs> we could have taken some of our beef, couldn't we? We could have had we some burgers. We could have burgers. sort of had a stall on the <laughs> <Yeah. side. laughs> A few hours southwest and in the heart of London, that same brew of bewilderment and pride. Have you got in that trusty phone of yours that picture of your dress? I am the boss of You're very curious about I am, my dress. I, I, you would, I'm you, not gonna my get dress to see is going to be a huge surprise. I, Pamela Amnonesi doesn't know the royals, doesn't know who nominated her or why, but watch her in action and it starts to make sense. Hello, May. She runs the 306 Collective a program designed to help people recovering from mental illnesses. Wow. This is the one that's going to be for Sharon. They create, sell, talk, and stand taller. Especially so when Prince Harry finally decided to share with the world just how hard it was for him to lose his mom. His battles against the stigma of mental health challenges have been Pamela's battles too. Did it make it easier to explain to people that there's no shame attached to it once Prince Harry had openly started talking about it. Oh, yes, certainly. It, it became easier. People actually started saying, if a prince can take ownership that they have mental health, I am ready to raise awareness so people know that, yes, I can cope with mental health in the community like every other person. Which one of these is your best seller? To invite Pamela is to shine a light on the collective, just maybe the more light, the more donations. There's the method to this. And sometimes the invites just seem to be about a gesture for someone who really needs a break. So what are you going to do? Which, which one do you think? I don't know. I quite like the pink one. How big a deal is this to you? Um, very important, because I want to look like right. And I want to have like the right hair, the right dress, the right shoes. And I just want to make sure like it all looks like right. Why is that important? I don't know. It's just I don't want to look wrong. This one looks more old than this one looks a bit younger. Do you know what I mean? Amelia Thompson of Sheffield is 12, going on so much older. <laughs> I'm not looking childish. No, no one will accuse you of looking childish in that. Last May, she was given a gift, a chance to see her favorite Ariana Grande in concert that's the one that I bought at the original concert. That mattered because she'd recently lost her uncle and watched her dad end up ill in the ICU. It had been a lot to endure. She and her mom went to the Manchester concert on May 22nd, and then the world stopped. A terror attack, 22 people killed. Amelia happened to be looking right at the bomb when it detonated. What she saw, no one should see. Is there anything that you want to say about what happened to you, knowing that you don't have to say anything at all? I don't mind. OK. What, what can you tell me? Um, so when the, the bomb exploded, um, we, I had an asthma attack, well, a panic attack, which brought on my asthma attack. And my mum dragged me down the side of the stage. In the panic, security guards tried to get them out, but ended up walking them right past the dead and wounded, left them with the gravely hurt. Her mom started applying first aid to the kids. Amelia crumpled to the ground. And I hear that you have had the most beautiful singing voice and that your voice changed a bit. Yeah, because um, 
I couldn't speak for quite a while after the bombing, so my mum took me to the hospital and it turned out that I'd damaged my vocal cords from screaming at the bombing. Imagine how long and hard you'd have to scream to effectively shred your vocal cords. Come on, Victor! He's the one. Yeah. And that's the one who's just put up his head. Come on! Healing from this physically, psychologically takes time. There's the love of her mom and mercifully a therapy horse. <laughs> this is such a good idea. And there's an unexpected friendship with the woman whose granddaughter died in the attack. The woman's name is Sharon, and Amelia has decided she will be her date for the wedding. And make no mistake, this little girl is thrilled to get the invite, but also a little scared. I'm going to be in, like, quite a crowded space. I'm going to be, like, quite around quite a lot of people, so it's going to help me, like, get used to certain situations. Has that been a hard thing for you? Yeah, because after the bombing, like, I didn't, like, go out a lot. Like, I didn't go in crowded spaces, and now I'm just starting trying to. She will screw up her courage and go with Sharon by her side. Good boy. Has promised to send us a picture of the dress that makes the cut. This day won't make everything better, but it will be a sweet memory to dilute the others. When the royal couple talk of making this a wedding for the people, that's what this is, and what another worldly scene it will be on the grounds of Windsor Castle. Amelia and all the others with the golden tickets and the stories taking them there. <laughs> there will be at least one Canadian among those 1,200 on the castle lawn. Faith Dickinson is a 15-year-old who made the trip from Peterborough, Ontario. Last year, she was recognized by Prince Harry and his brother for her charity, which provides free blankets to cancer patients. She says she's got her dream dress ready for tomorrow. We've got more special coverage from Windsor ahead, including a look at what changes for Meghan Markle after tomorrow. But first, the couple has kept tight-lipped about the guest list, but it's sure to have its share of star power. And finally, this is where you'll live. Well before Meghan Markle was a bride-to-be, wow. she was a star Thank on Suits, the TV legal drama shot in Toronto. This is an incredible yeah. step in her life, uh -huh. and so to bear witness to that is extraordinary. Did you co-stars have touched down in Windsor, ready for the big day? We became family in a way. We're, we're still family, so mm -hmm. this, is, this is a wonderful family affair. Wait. Did you get an invitation? Well, it was sp five Spice Girls. Did. Why am I so honest? Oh, my God! <laughs> And it seems the Spice Girls may spice up this event. According to Mel B, Scary, Sporty, Ginger, Baby, and Posh are all on the guest list. We'll find out. If you want to be my lover. Also expected, Elton John, a close friend of Diana's. He has canceled two Las Vegas gigs this weekend, leading many to wonder, might he perform here tomorrow? Tonight on The National, more than 30 years after a B.C. couple was murdered in Washington State, police say they've cracked the case. And once again, a genealogy website helped lead them to the alleged killer, in this case, a 55-year-old Seattle man. Tanya Van Kylenborg and Jay Cook were killed during a trip to Washington in 1987. It was a cold case for decades until recently when detectives tried a fairly novel technique. It's the genetic genealogy that was the key uh, tool that got this case resolved. And had law enforcement never had access to genetic genealogy, I don't believe this case could ever be solved. Detectives took DNA evidence from the crime scene and uploaded it to a public genealogy website. From there, they were able to build a family tree and eventually track down their suspect who matched the DNA sample. This is the same technique that led to the arrest of this suspected serial killer in California last month. With my 100 soldiers, it's, it's just a little bit more manpower. We're here to support them and just to help them get through the, the next uh, you know, 24, 48, 72 hours. Help has arrived in flood-ravaged BC. About 100 soldiers are on the ground in Grand Forks and 200 others have been deployed across the southern interior. The region has been dealing with flooding for a week now and could see a second surge this weekend as rivers peak. 
The military says it'll stay as long as needed to help with evacuations, sandbagging, and shoring up dams and dikes. And Alberta First Nation is trying a new approach for its housing crisis. Young people are helping build a tiny home for an elder, hoping to lay the foundation for lasting change. Carolyn Dunn went to check it out. Pecani Nation elder Joyce Little Mustache is well known in her community for her artisanship, beading moccasins and other traditional pieces. But these days the buzz about Joyce is that she'll soon move into her own home for the first time in her life. It's really exciting and I'm very um, grateful, appreciative, and even when I want to scream. <laughs> The one-bedroom, 67-square-meter house is a $250,000 pilot project funded by the federal government. It's just a tiny house, but it may be part of the fix for some much bigger problems. You see, just three years ago, Pecani Nation had more than $17 million in housing debt. Federal housing funds had been cut off, homes were falling into disrepair, and many were severely overcrowded. The reserve tightened its belt and paid the debt off in two short years. In addition to being eligible for new housing loans again, the nation was also awarded this pilot project, which is a lot more than just the construction of a small house. 13 of these construction workers are high school students, like 16-year-old Sienna Smith. Really inspired me. I think it's really cool that I'm actually out here experiencing and get a little like taste of what it's like. The students not only get experience in trades and budgeting, they also get high school credits and a small honorarium. Thunder Crowshoe, another 16-year-old, rattles off just a few skills he's picked up working on this project. I also learned uh, how to do roofing, uh, shingling. But Crowshoe shows the most pride when talking about building a home for an elder. They hold uh, a lot of wisdom and uh, a lot of experience through life. Teacher Ken Perry says the effect on the students taking part is nothing short of remarkable. When they're in the classroom, they, they kind of hold back and everything, but when they get out here, and they start building and they get their hands involved in it, then they, it, uh, it gives them confidence. Joyce Little Mustache shows up to tour her tiny house in progress for the first time and to meet the young people making it happen. Oh my, and this is gonna be the front. Hello. <laughs> Who are you? And just like that, she can picture herself living here. It's going to be home. <laughs> Finally. A dream come true for an elder, a head start for youth in her community. If this pilot project is proven successful, watch for similar tiny house projects on reserves across Canada. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, Pecani Nation, Alberta. Much more ahead tonight on The National. Let's take a live look at Windsor Castle, where it's now almost 3 a.m., just a few hours away from the royal wedding. Adrian is back with more special coverage right after the break. There is nothing like a royal occasion for hauling out the headgear where the line between style and statement can get a little fuzzy. So time for a little protocol. You just cannot have a royal wedding without some sort of deep dive into the right and wrong way to refer to the bride and groom, or crucially, to Meghan Markle. How do you greet the in-laws? So let's talk titles. It's such an easy line. Meghan Markle, the American princess, the Hollywood princess, the breath of fresh air princess. But there are a few problems with that narrative, starting with not everyone is on board. She's ordinary. She's my, ordinary? In my opinion. In, in a good way? No, I don't think so. No. Think, so really, you don't think no. she's going to be a beautiful princess? I would wish for Harris somebody really nice. Uh. <laughs> so it can be a tough, judgmental crowd, but Andrew Pierce of the Daily Mail will tell you that's not even the half of it. We know that the Americans are very fond of referring to Meghan Markle as Princess Meghan. Are they right or are they wrong? They're absolutely wrong. She's not Princess Meghan. And when they're married on Saturday, well, they'll announce the title and she will be the Duchess of somewhere. 
Okay, let's back up. She won't be Princess Meghan because the title followed by the woman's first name is reserved for those born into the family. Think Princess Charlotte. Diana was referred to as the Princess of Wales as a courtesy, but never Princess Diana. Confused? It gets worse. Meghan will be known as Her Royal Highness, but once the ring is on that finger, the couple will likely also be named the Duke and Duchess of Sussex. Why Sussex? Just a guess, really, but the title is available and there's no scandal associated with it. That matters. Now, when it comes to royal curtsying, it is... So does the protocol, which is why the Council of Etiquette expert William Hansen is key. If Meghan were walking down a corridor at Buckingham Palace on the arm of her husband, after the wedding, Prince Harry, then if she bumped into, let's say, Princess Beatrice, Princess Eugenie, then they would have to curtsy to Meghan and Harry because Meghan takes the status of her husband, who is a blood member of the royal family. But if she were to walk that same corridor on her own without Prince Harry, then she would be the one curtsying to Princesses Beatrice and Eugenie. Curiously, though, a need for a woman to curtsy might not be what it once was. Do women have to curtsy now, or because it's 2018, can a woman bow? Well, a woman can bow or curtsy or not do either because the Queen let it be known. She never tells us these things. She lets it be known that actually she's quite relaxed about people not curtsying. And I bet you uh, she curtsies when she meets Prince Philip, who's a real old stickler. Prince Philip surely isn't the only stickler in the household. Fact is, it's also tangled that back in 2005, when Camilla married Charles, the Queen's private secretary issued a brand new manual on the hierarchy and how to greet everyone. Complicated, these royal families. Of course, all eyes tomorrow will be on the dress. And no surprise, here in the UK, the bookies are taking action. Ralph and Russo has emerged as the clear favorite. The high-end British brand designed the dress she wore for official engagement photos. But don't sleep on Canadian designer Airdem. Megan's a fan, and it would be a fitting nod to Toronto, where she filmed suits. There are other fashion houses thought to be in the running, Britain's luxury brand Burberry and Alexander McQueen. That's the brand that designed Kate Middleton's spectacular gown in 2011. And tonight on The National, we're keeping a close eye on the Democratic Republic of the Congo, where there are now four confirmed cases of Ebola virus in an urban centre. The World Health Organization has stopped short of declaring a public health emergency, but has now raised the national public health risk to very high and is taking steps to stop the spread. More than two months after being poisoned by a nerve agent, former Russian pot spy Sergei Skripal has been discharged from hospital in the UK. Britain and its allies accused Russia of attacking Skripal and his daughter, who also survived. The Kremlin continues to deny any involvement. Today, the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, said that if a military-grade substance had been used, the Skripals would have died immediately. Take a look at this from Hawaii tonight. The Kilauea eruption showing no signs of slowing down. You can hear the roar of the earth as lava erupts from the open fissures. There are now 22 geologists warning this volcano could become even more violent in the coming days. Let's turn back to our top story tonight, the royal wedding. Canadians who want to watch it live are in for a very early start tomorrow, but plans are being made for viewing parties and tea parties across the country. Ron Charles looks at some of the preparations in Toronto. And it always starts with the base tea. Daniel now, Lewis we'll mixes his here. latest here. blend of tea at the shop he owns with his wife Renata, a new yep. brew in honor of the royal wedding. The finishing touch to this blend when Harry met Meghan is the sparkle for the Markle, for Miss Markle. So these are silver chocolate dragies. He'll be serving cups of it at an early morning tea party. The H and M latte. Right, Harry Post make it. Taste of that. So let's see how you like that. Oh, it's good. There you go. Lewis and his teas have a special connection to one member of the royal family. His volunteer work with the Prince's Charities Canada led to him being picked to make tea for Prince Charles during a break in last year's royal visit. 
he loved it. He, he wanted to know where, how it was made. He ordered some from the palace uh, a week later, and then he wrote uh, about two months after a letter to us saying how much he's enjoying it. Toronto's Fairmount Royal York Hotel has obvious connections to the royal family. Its members, including Prince Harry, have often stayed there. This week, the hotel created an English garden scene in the lobby with a display of the food available at a wedding breakfast tomorrow morning. We came out with the new tea ideas, new pastries, new cake, new sandwiches. So that's what we're trying to match up. All the local ingredients, trying to do uh, English-style high tea. A few blocks away, another place with royal connections is hosting another wedding viewing party. Toronto's Princess of Wales Theatre was named after Harry's mother, Diana, when it opened in 1993. Her letter thanking the owners hangs in the lobby. And it's the only venue in the world named after her. We happened to have a dark week. We didn't have a show on. We're between shows, so we thought, why don't we take this opportunity and do that? We just think it's, it's better to get people together to watch an event like this. A lot of people would agree the 2,000 free tickets were snapped up. Ron Charles, CBC News, Toronto. So, Adrian, I know you've been preparing for the story for weeks. You've been there for days, <laughs> now just hours to go. What are you looking forward to the most? Well, it would be wrong if I didn't say I'm looking forward to the Fascinator game. I know it's always strong in this country. I'm also looking forward to the moment that no one knows is coming. You know, there's all, at an event like this, there's always a, a picture or a moment or, or an interaction that stands the test of time, and we have no idea what it's going to be, but we'll find out tomorrow. So that's enough from me. That is the national for May 18th. You have one more sleep to go, or you might as well just stay up. I know I will. That's because our special coverage starts at 4 a.m. Eastern time. So watch the royal wedding, Meghan and Harry, live from Windsor on CBC Television, CBC News Network, on our website, Facebook, and YouTube. We'll see you then. Good night.